Hi, it's Grace, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm gonna to be filming the second half of my August wrap up. I filmed a mid-month wrap up in the middle of the month, so I'll link that below if you haven't watched it. But in the second half of August, I read seven books and that is what I'll be talking about today. If you did watch my mid-month wrap up, you will have seen that I was doing Women in Translation Month, so trying to read as many books as I could that were Women in Translation in August and there was a specific readathon which I also vlogged, so I'll link that down below. So in the first half of the month, I went through my whip month tbr so then i had a little break um and picked up a very exciting new arrival that was the death of vivek og by akweke amezi so i talked about this book in a book haul that i did where i'd already actually read the book and i was finding it very stressful <laughs> trying to like not review the book but then haul the book basically i loved this book it was amazing it is about um, a man called vivek og a boy, I guess, man, growing up in Nigeria, and it's really about his family life. You meet his parents and his grandparent and aunts and uncles, and he has a cousin called Asita, who's also quite a big character in here. And I really don't think you want to know too much more than that going into it, other than I guess Vivek dies, and that is clear from the title, but yeah, you immediately know at the start of the book that Vivek has died, and you're kind of moving back in time to find out what happened and also dealing with the reactions of his family and his friends afterwards. It's not like a kind of, you know, murder mystery. There's an aspect of intrigue, but that's not really what the book's about. So I love this book and I gave it, well, I don't know what I gave it. Basically, I also read Freshwater in August, at the start of August. My God, August just seems like it's been about 10 million years long. Like when I realized I'd also read Freshwater in the same month, I was like, and I loved Freshwater more than this. And Freshwater was a five star for me. So then it felt like, could this be a five star? Obviously there's everything subjective, there's degrees of anything, but I think because they were both by Quake and Messi, I was like, oh, I don't know. But I marked it as a five on Goodreads. Um, and I really did love it. I just love Amezi's writing. I think I've made that clear in like all of the videos that I've talked about their writing. I think it's gorgeous. I'm gonna read Pet, which is their YA novel. It was one of those books where, as I say, I didn't know a huge amount of it going into it. And just immediately from like the first page, I was just like, I'm obsessed. I'm, I, nothing was even really happening, but I don't know what it is about the writing that's just so captivating. I've been kind of more increasingly reading stuff set in Nigeria, and I think it's really fascinating, especially the time at which Kweke Mezi sets this in Nigerian history. It's also partly a kind of love story um, that's kind of a bit of a controversial one. It's also basically about the trans experience and gender, like it does a lot of stuff. It's also extremely spiritual. So yeah, it's not a particularly long book, but I just think it does some really interesting stuff and is very moving, but at the same time is, I don't know, it really pushes the boundaries. As I say, there's sort of this love story, but it's an incredibly taboo, controversial love story that I know does actually put off people. I would also recommend if you have read this, watching a Kweke Amezi's interview. I'll link it below. They did an interview with River Solomon for like an American bookshop. And I basically found it because I finished this book and I knew I'd love the storytelling and, and all the stuff it was doing, but there were a few things that I wasn't sure about, kind of specifically that sort of taboo love story. I wasn't really sure how I should feel, which is kind of stupid, I guess. You should just know how you feel. But I was really interested as to the sort of, um, not just vacation, but the thoughts behind that, especially as, that's the thing that kept coming up in the Goodreads reviews was that people were really put off by that. And I know I'd spoken to CJ from CJ Reads who just finished it at the same time as me. And she was like, I'm really not sure about that. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what to think. Found this interview and it just contextualized it so, so well. Like I am a person who likes to kind of have a companion to my reading. I, I know it's like death of the author, but I do care what the author wanted to do with a book that interests me. I don't think that has to interest you or, um, you know, dictate your reading experience but personally I enjoy that and I just thought not even that one specific kind of taboo aspect but just the entire interview I thought was fascinating in kind of accompanying the reading of this book under fresh water they are also just the most affable I think whenever someone's a really amazing writer and tackles quite difficult things I have a perception of that author as maybe being a bit cold or a bit you know pretentious and just watching that, I was like, I just want to be mates with the Quake Messi because yeah, like I say, they were just so enthusiastic and funny and yeah. I definitely think um, I would recommend this book. I think, I don't really know if it's like a trigger warning kind of thing, um, but maybe look it up. But yeah, I really did recommend this. I thought it was 
really beautiful um, but harrowing and did really make me think about different things and different experiences of Quake Game as he does a brilliant job of helping you, the reader, to understand the experience of someone who is non-binary or transgender as far as, you know, you can do when you haven't experienced it. But also, like I say, about spirituality, about taboo topics, this book just really, really made me think and I loved it. Next up, another book that I hauled, having read it, is In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Mercado and another one that I loved and that I gave five stars. I really was blown away by this book. I think it's excellent. It's Carmen Maria Mercado's memoir. She is a short, well, she's a writer, but her short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties was like extremely well received. And then she came out with this memoir, which is her experience of being in an abusive lesbian relationship. And it is in part memoir um, in a very experimental way, but also in part kind of not theory as such, but I guess placing her experience in the world of queer theory and kind of thinking about the fact that abuse in queer relationships isn't something that's discussed a lot or something that has had a lot of kind of academic thought put to it. I say it's experimental in form because it's told in these sort of vignettes. Some of them are much longer. Some of them are kind of, you know, like a page less than that. Others would go on for, you know, like a good few pages. And the idea is that she looks at the dream house, which is this house in which she lived for a time and her partner lived in when they were together and when she was suffering this abuse views it in kind of different literary tropes i guess so the dream house's metaphor the dream house as deja vu the dream house's romance novel the, there's just all these different ways of kind of framing the particular anecdote that she's talking about or the particular reflection on that experience um, and i really like that at the same time this is incredibly personal it isn't cold or academic it's extremely readable um i just think that memoirs work really well for me when they're told in a kind of non-linear way the writing in this was just amazing like there's some pieces in here that i just don't know i felt really impressed by that sounds a bit patronizing but just because like i say it's a really difficult thing that Carmen Maria Mercado experienced and then to have to write about. It's a vulnerable thing to write about. It's, you know, she talks about it being kind of like triggering within yourself. You're angry, you're hurt, you're still confused. And I think to be able to write that in a readable, moving way, but then also to be so kind of creative with language is difficult to read about, but it's really important. Like I say, not only because I think as society, we still need to like reframe the way we see abuse, but also in the context of it being in a queer relationship and all of the stuff that's in here about that. I did find some of the referencing slightly off-putting. So on the majority of pages, I would say there'll be footnotes that kind of relate to this theory about whether it's the literature thing she's talking about, whether it's queer theory or whether it's whatever. And sometimes those footnotes are really long and I always just struggle when there's big footnotes as where to read them. It kind of throws me off a bit because I'm like, oh, well, that one goes over the page. But then if I break up that paragraph to then read this big footnote and then go back. So that's a totally personal preference thing. But yeah, I just thought this writing was stunning. And yeah, I just think this is brilliant. Would really recommend everyone reading it. Okay, so the next four books are the four books that I read for the Women in Translation Readathon, and I did vlog that. It went up as my last video. So I'll link it below if you haven't seen it. So I'm not gonna spend too long talking about these books because like I say, you can watch my live reactions as I read them. Interestingly though, interestingly, interestingly though, out of those four books, we got a two star, a three star, a four star, and a five star. Two star, Liar by Aliette Gundar Goshen which is translated from Hebrew by Sandra Silverstone. This is about a young girl living in Lebanon, I think, and she works in an ice cream shop. She's 17, doesn't really have any friends, is very self-conscious, has never had a boyfriend, has all these sort of fantasies about what her life is gonna be like that aren't living up to it. And then this famous fading pop star comes into the ice cream shop where she works. There's an altercation in which People think he's sexually assaulted her and he hasn't and she goes along with it and is kind of thrust into the limelight. It's like a police investigation. She's getting all this media coverage and attention uh, and there's also a young boy who she meets because he saw that it didn't happen to her and he starts to blackmail her but then they kind of start a relationship. 
I was interested by that prospect. However, as I kind of mentioned in the vlog, because typically I don't like kind of false rape allegation storylines because I think often they're just overblown and used as like a justification for people to be like, yeah, this happens all the time when they don't. Obviously they do happen, but I was really interested to see like how the author would kind of spin off from that and if they were gonna take it somewhere really interesting. And for me, they didn't because it was very much just like, this person is lying. Are they gonna get found out? How do they feel about it? How do other people feel about it? Blah, blah, blah. And that's fine, just wasn't for me. Did not connect with it. Didn't care about any of the characters like remotely. Um, found the main character and the kind of other teenage boy who you spend most of your time with extremely angsty. They're all kind of like pitiable. They're just desperate for love and they're lying, doing these sort of amoral things in pursuit of that. And then all of the other characters, you didn't get a huge amount of them, but I just felt nothing. I kind of had to push myself to finish it really. It then introduced a different storyline quite late on that I thought was a bit more interesting, but felt a bit incongruous other than that they were like another liar. And I guess it was trying to look at, um, I feel bad, like I never really read books that I don't like, I feel bad like slaying it. I'm not really slaying it, but I guess it was trying to look at like, you know, why do people lie? Why do people believe lies? How far will people go? which should be interesting, but just in this context of this exact situation, I didn't enjoy reading about it. Also the writing, I thought I liked it first and then as I said in the vlog, it, there's a lot of similes used in here and I found a lot of them very clunky, um, just sort of, yeah, overwritten. So yeah, unfortunately this was a new two star. And then the three star is that our Sour Murders by Riku Onda. To be honest, this is more like a 3.5. I did really, really enjoy it. The ending kind of took it down from that four for me just because it, let me down a bit basically. It's a Japanese crime novel. Um, it's translated by Alison Watts and it's written in a really interesting style that really appealed to me. So it's about this kind of cold case where, or this old case, if you will, where a family were having a party with guests. They were all poisoned, 17 people died. Only their blind daughter wasn't poisoned. Um, someone was then arrested for it, but people have always been a bit skeptical about whether he actually did it because they couldn't work out how, what was his motive, what was his connection to the family. And so you're reading about this as this sort of dossier of someone's interviewing people who are related to the case and you get occasional kind of police reports and stuff, but you're not sure who's doing this interviewing. There's subsequently been a book written about the case by another girl who lived in the neighborhood. Um, so you hear about you interview her who wrote the book about it, you hear about from the publisher, how people perceived it, other people from the neighborhood, and all the time you're getting this one-sided dialogue where you're not sure who is sort of investigating this. So I really liked all that. It made me feel very like on my toes, wasn't sure what was gonna happen. Um, just thought it was a really interesting way to write a crime novel and I was really intrigued by this poisoning because I found it really creepy, found the daughter really creepy and yeah it was all going really well and then it just slightly tapered off towards the end because there was what I thought was like a good twist, like a slightly odd in the the twist I guess kind of hinged on a less important character so then it was a bit like okay um, but that still wasn't like the big twist or the big reveal of what had happened and then I got like an explanation for what happened, which I was quite happy with. And then the last like five pages, I just have no idea what it was going on about. It was as if this massive thing had happened. It was very much like, OMG, OMG. But I did was like, sorry, I, I don't know how this relates to it. So possibly my fault. I would read more Ricky Wanda because like I say, thought it worked really well in terms of format and writing style. It just didn't quite like stick the landing for me. So yeah, three, 3.5. The four star is Apple and Knife by Intan Pamaditha, which is translated from Indonesian by Stephen J. Epstein. So this is a short story collection and I never read short story collections like ever, but I really enjoyed it. So I picked this up because it was described as being like feminist horror fairy tale retellings. So I was like, okay, well that sounds um, amazing. And yeah, it, it was, it was really good. So it's made up of 13 quite short, short stories that are various sort of retellings slash imaginings slash inspired by fairy tales, but in a quite dark supernatural way. So some of them are in the modern world. Some of them are in a sort of more fantasy world. A lot of them slash most of them are um, like inspired by Eastern cultures. So a lot of them are in Indonesia, but also Egypt and various other Eastern countries. And I just found them really fun and really refreshing. I liked getting the sort of fairy tale-ness 
with some fairy tales that I wasn't familiar with because they're not your standard like Western ones. That was really interesting, kept it exciting. I thought it was extremely feminist and I thought a lot of the stories that I really liked were the ones that, I mean, they all are in a sense, but that really looked into sort of like female rage and the issues around sexual violence. Um, I don't have huge amounts to say about it. I guess, you know, obviously some stories I preferred to others, but on the whole, I thought it was really good and would really recommend it if you're into short stories or if you want to get into short stories, because like I say, I don't really read short stories. I would say I was hoping it would be a bit darker and like there are some really, really dark things in here, but I just kept hearing like, oh my God, that book's messed up. And I'm like, is it me? I would have liked to be more messed up. And then the five star book is Eve Out of Her Ruins by Amanda Devi. And this was translated from French by Jeffrey Zuckerman, but Amanda Devi is a Mauritian author. I'd never read anything about Mauritius before, but this is an incredibly short book that follows the lives of a few Mauritian teenagers, uh, mainly Eve, and then two male characters who are her peers, and you kind of follow them over a short space of time. They're living in a place called Trumaron, which is not really a, a very deprived part of Mauritius. It's very run down. People feel very disenfranchised. Um, the young men of the novel feel very angry and like there's nothing for them there other than kind of forming gangs and being quite aggressive and for the women uh it's a seemingly quite a patriarchal society or at least they experience a lot of abuse from men on a daily basis a lot of the women are either kind of subservient or like eve they act out and then are sort of punished for that or are perceived as alien and as something to control by the men um, I wouldn't want to say any more about the plot just because it's so short. I don't think you need to know any more than that. It's very harrowing. Um, horrible stuff happens in here and on the whole it's just a very bleak perspective on life for these characters. Um, there's not a huge amount of hope in the novel but it is beautifully written, like stunning. The translator's note was so interesting about the way that Jeffrey Zuckerman is kind of talking about how Amanda Devi uses writing and the ways he tried to sort of emulate that in his translation. She has quite a kind of lyrical, but also playful, he was saying, style in the way that she uses English and French. So in Mauritius, it's a lot of people are fluent in English, French and Creole. And yeah, the main reason that I love this book so much is just because on top of the writing, it is just so brutal, but brutally kind of honest about Eve's experience as a woman and the kind of things she is subjected to by men, the way that she then acts and reacts and the sort of way she is formed by that and the way she rebels against that. I thought it was so interesting. Such a, yeah, raw perspective on that. Some of the best writing about kind of the female experience of being, you know, abused and objectified. This obviously on an extreme scale but yeah i just think this book is amazing like one of the best books i've read so far this year definitely it's short it's sharp it's a gut punch um but and it is hard to read definitely but yeah i really 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 recommend it and then finally the last book that i read this month is my name is why by lem sisse and it is lem sisse's memoir lem is a writer and a poet famously and this is his story of his life in the care system in england specifically in wigan so he was fostered from a very young age to a white family. Lem is Ethiopian, um, but was born in Wigan. He's fostered to a white family who raised him as their own until he's 12. And then for various kind of reasons, put him back into the care system. And he's then there until he's an adult. And he doesn't actually learn about his history so that his the situation with his mother, that she was from Ethiopia, that she actually named him Lem, they changed his name to Norman. He didn't find any of that out until a teenager and he didn't get all of the notes and files on his fostering care experience until he was an adult. And that is where this book came from. I think he got them in 2015 and the book contains actual kind of transcripts and parts of the files that he found and it's really him reading these files and then reflecting on that and kind of comparing that to his own lived experience and looking at the way that you know the first 18 years of his life have been distilled into these notes um and yeah it's it's again it's not and not an easy read it's heartbreaking the treatment that he faced throughout the whole 18 years there's like one person who i guess showed him any 
love or affection, the idea of being, for all intents and purposes, adopted. He couldn't be adopted, but this family took him in. They were his family. And then at 12 years old to just sort of give them up the like trauma of that. And it's so hard when you read the parts when at first Lem just thought he would be going back and it's awful. And I mean, a lot of it is racially motivated. Some of the, the ways he's kind of talked about in here um, in these notes or the kind of caveats put on things because of his race is just horrible to read. But it's such a moving book, not just because it's sad, but because of the way that, again, kind of with what I was saying about Carmen Maria Mercado, the way Lem manages to convert that into like a beautiful and exceptionally written piece of literature is like stunning. Uh, he includes some of his poetry kind of at the start of each chapter, which I love because I love his poetry. Um, and yeah, it's just a really exceptional book that someone has the range within them to experience something like that and then to create like such brilliant art from it because it is just, it's fascinating on that kind of human level of, you, know, you can't believe that this was allowed to happen and, and that it, this is a very real experience for like a lot of people growing up in care. It's interesting on that note, but also interesting on a level of then how he's talking about that and the way he sees it. And yeah, it's just beautifully written. I just would really recommend this. It didn't take me long to read. I read it in one sitting in the car and yeah, just so, so good. Would highly recommend. Okay, so that's all. I was literally like, oh, there's only a few books. I've talked about most of them. This will be a quick video. I've been filming for half an hour. Really positive reading actually. Like I haven't read a two star in a while, but other than that, I got some five, that was like four out of seven five star books. Like that's pretty, crazy and i loved doing the women in translation thing i'm definitely going to keep reading more women in translation but for september i am also quite looking forward to not having like a set tbr because i never usually do that but obviously i had to like plan ahead of it so yeah looking forward to september I have a lot of exciting books to read thanks so much for watching i'll see you in my next one bye